Today we're going to be talking about the 12 gauge cartridge. We're going to be talking about loads, shot sizes, powders, and a few of the myths to do with it. What it's for, how to choose the right one for you, and more importantly, why this is probably the best caliber on earth. To start with, let's talk about what a 12 gauge actually is. Interestingly, unlike rifle ammunition, shotgun ammunition only has specifics for what the case is, chamber sizes and case size. 12 bore is called 12 bore or 12 bore gauge as it originally was. Americans will call it 12 gauge, Brits will call it 12 bore. We can agree to differ, both work. Put as simply as we can, a 12 bore is one twelfth of a pound of lead in a sphere and that ball should fit down the ball of a 12 ball. 20 ball, 20 balls of lead, hence it is smaller, so it works in a sort of a, a reverse order to one might think. Four ball, quarter pound balls of lead. What that leaves us with is an awkward variance as to what a 12 ball actually is, which is probably the first time I'll say this, although we'll say this many times, why 12 bore ballistics is as much black magic as it is science. Unlike modern rifles where the bore size is set, the chamber size is set, and so the ballistic science of it is pretty much solved, a 12 bore nominal bore size of 18.5 millimeters or 0.729 of an inch. However, that is nominally 729 or 18.5, a 12 bore can range from 18 millimeter internal bore size, that's 0.710 of an inch, up to 20 millimeters. 20 millimeters is 0.790 of an inch. That is, I mean, that's two millimeters internal bore size difference. That by any engineer's things is basically a mile. And that is part of the issue when people are buying and selling shotgun cartridges. Obviously those extremes aren't pushed too, too regularly, but you will see 18.8 millimeters down to 18.1 or 0 0.710, 719, all the way up to 749 of an inch with some fair regularity. Back in the day, tighter was potentially better. Variances in shotgun ammunition meant that if you wanted a consistent seal, you would have a tighter bore. That obviously creates more friction, more abrasion to the pellets, more deformity, but you do get more consistency in shot speed, I believe, and that is a big deal. More importantly, when it comes to slugs and all round shooting, a tighter bore will perform better with slugs and generally across the board. Going to the other side of the spectrum, going into bigger bores, we're leaning into the more modern market of bore profiles, large tapered forcing guns. We did a film with Beretta where they proved my skepticism wrong, which was really interesting, that actually larger bores do enhance performance. They reduce recoil and produce a slightly faster speed of cartridge. Also, because you're not constricting the shot so much, you get less deformity. These little balls that live inside of a shotgun are made of lead for the most part, although there are four major metals they're made of. We'll go into that in a minute. Lead is soft and as such, when it's pushed into a tighter circle, what happens is they get deformed. Those deformed pellets fly less well through the air, meaning your pattern will spread, things will drop off, it becomes longer. And so there is benefits, mass benefits to having a larger bore size. If you're shooting slugs, you don't want that because you actually gain massive inaccuracy. Generally speaking, most shotguns on the market will be good for just about anything, but buying the correct bore size for the application is important. First time I'll say this as well is that regardless of all this information, you still need to put the gun in the right place, regardless of patterns, pellets, all this sort of thing. Obviously doing all this part right and choosing the right cartridge for you is probably wise. However, learning to use the tool with some proficiency, being the gun, is important. After bore size, bore diameter, let's go into chamber length size is the only part of a shotgun that is regulated. There is a set size and a set length. I have four examples of cartridge length here. Bear in mind that the lengths that we discuss are the complete opened and the uncrimped length of a shotgun cartridge and actually the crimped length matters not. Here we have a two and a half, a two and three quarter, three inch and three and a half inch or 65, 70, 76 and 88 millimeters. All of these things will require a gun with the appropriate size of chamber. You can, of course, put shorter cartridges into longer chambers. However, there is some science out there to say that that is not as optimal as putting it into the correct chamber size, especially when it comes to steel shot. One of the cartridges I'm missing is the two inch cartridge. They are pretty uncommon and when they do come up for sale second hand, people buy them up and I didn't have access to any new ones, unfortunately. A two inch load was actually invented well before the two inch chambered gun was invented. 
this is here now to represent a two inches there or thereabouts. Obviously crimped, uncrimped, it'd be way longer. They originally were invented to take more cartridges in your pocket and reduce the load and recall that you would suffer on large volume driven shoot days that were happening in the late 19th century. They never really took off. Uh, the press at the time absolutely berated them. A lot of that was to do with, they were short, they were really, they were experimenting. They shortened wads, they were trying to fit sort of, again, up to th three quarters to seven eighths of an ounce into one of these. And that was perhaps not super optimal. In fact, you know, they were looking even more than that. What is that, 15 sixteenths of an ounce? That's a fair amount of lead in there. What they'd end up with as well, because there was a little gap before the forcing cone was the pot potential of shot balling. I have fired two inch ammo through a two and three quarter inch gun and never suffered this. I did a little test when I had a box just to see if I could recreate it. I couldn't. So perhaps, you know, we're talking 140 years ago, the press didn't have scruples back then, which they obviously do now. I, um, I, I I do wonder whether that was just comp competitive bitchery rather than actually anything serious. I will get off this quickly because this is an almost redundant cartridge, although that does have a small fan following. They, in the 1930s, short 25 inch guns, lightweight guns became popular. And so the two inch gun made a resurgence, but with specially chambered two inch guns for two inch cartridges. What that allowed, because you could load this with lower pressure, you could have thinner barrels, shorter chambers, less meat in the action, less meat at the breech end of the barrels, meaning you could bring a 12 bore down to about five pounds, five and a half pounds in weight. That is pretty mental. And I know a lot of walked up hunters in the USA and in the UK who use these because you can get a really nice performing three quarter ounce load in a five pound gun, but it's still a 12 bore. And you know, that's nice. There's certainly less fiddle going on with one of these than with a uh, smaller unit. All right, dead cartridge over. It's probably worth spending two seconds on the fact that there is a one and a three quarters, one and three quarters, one and a half, one and three quarter inch shell called a shorty. They're generally used for home defense. Um, I don't know anything about them. I first saw them last year. I thought they were really cool. I'd like to go clay shooting with them, mostly because people said you couldn't. If you're looking at about three quarters of an ounce, half an ounce to three quarters of an ounce of seven and a half and eight shot, going at like 1200 feet per second, American. So what's that, 1350 in the UK? That seems like we should be able to shoot clays with it. Obviously be an expensive habit, but we'll do it next time we're over there. Moving into the more popular cartridges of the modern era, we have a two and a half inch and two and three quarter inch. Two and a half inch cartridges are still very available in the UK, but less available in America. And that is because American guns were initially chambered way more in two and five eighths inch instead of two and a half inch. And shortly after the turn of the century and the invention, well, shortly after the invention of nitro powder in the 1880s, these guys in America went over to a 70 mil or two three quarter inch chamber and us Brits stayed on two and a half. I do wonder why that was. Um, I've read multiple theories, none of them matter. Probably because the aristocracy in this country was the people buying bulk ammo and most of them had two and a half inch chamber guns. So why change? More importantly, the American obsession with bigger loads and more recoil probably doesn't match up with what we were doing over here. Different gun markets entirely as we've discussed in the past. This can be fired in this chamber, this cannot be fired in this chamber, meaning if you have a two and three quarter inch cartridge, you cannot put it in a two and a half inch chamber and fire it. It will fit because obviously uncrimped, it is only about 60, 65 to 67 millimeters, but once it opens up, that's when you're in trouble. You will start tearing the ends off your shells, you'll start potentially balling, you'll start potentially giving yourself chamber bulges or barrel bulges by putting incorrect stuff in there. Two and a half inch cartridges are available in anywhere from a three quarter ounce load all the way up to what, an ounce and a quarter, ounce and five eighths if you are lucky, but mostly two and a half inch chambered guns are not designed for that kind of thing. That's when you move into the 70 mil. You'll rarely find two and a half inch cartridges over 32 grams, which is an ounce and a quarter, just, yes. It's, um, they're, they're great. And an interesting thing. In old guns, they're vitally important that you use them. Most guns now, pretty much every gun on the market sold new will either be 70 mil or three inch, way more likely three inch, which is interesting. Trap guns remain 70 mil because they rarely, well, a trap gun, you're never gonna need to put wildfowl loads in. Most sporters are really designed to be used in game shooting as well, so they're a bit more versatile. They will allow you to have a three inch chamber or they're all three inch chambered. And yet trap guns remain 70 mil. They had a really interesting discussion with a cartridge manufacturer about this and they said for steel, you should be using the correct 
cartridge for your chamber size to get optimum performance and actually we should be doing that all the time anyway. Nobody does, so let's not worry about that. 70 mil cartridges range from about 7 8 ounce, 24 gram, all the way up you can get these well, nearly 40 grams into a two and three quarter inch cartridge, which is pretty brutal. Most people won't be doing that, but you know, commonly you'll see 36 grams in one of these. You will start to run into issues with actually having the correct space to put a wad in there, which we'll go into in a minute. The three inch chamber was invented back in the day, well into the 19th century, for live pigeon shooting and wild fowling. Bigger the better is the theory of a three inch, right? How do I not use a 10 bore or a larger gauge shotgun while still throwing more lead down range back then? The answer was to increase chamber size. Suddenly you're not suffering from small wads, you can still put an adequate wad in there and you can increase your volume up to taking 50 grams. You know, you can get three inch cartridges with up to I think 54 grams, that's pretty impressive. In steel, quite a bit less because steel weighs less for the ball size, so the capacity isn't there, which is why the three and a half inch cartridge was invented, or at least part of that. Three inch guns, you can find old three inch guns. Most new guns are three inch. And if you feel the need to put three inch ammo in it, you can do so. Three inch ammo is mostly reserved for ducks, geese, long range ducks, geese, deer in countries where that's legal, and foxes, big game. Because, well, there's, not much need to load up this much death to go and shoot a small bird. We have the three and a half inch Magnum, the youngest cartridge at the table, invented in 1988 in a collaboration between Federal and Mossberg. That period in history, most countries were moving from using lead shot for wildfowl into using steel shot for wildfowl. Again, steel balls weigh less than lead balls in the same size because it is less dense and well, people still wanted to shoot ducks at obscene ranges, or quality ranges, the three and a half was invented. You can fit up to 70 grams of TSS in here. That's pretty mental. Or you can chuck two ounces of lead in them and one and three quarter to two ounces of steel. The capacity of one of these is huge. Obviously, that payload up front comes with a lot of power that's needed more robust guns because you can't just have more pressure without bulking up everything, thicker barrels, heavier actions, and pretty much, well, they, they do actually make, well, they do make, they make three and a half inch over and unders, yeah, they do. Yildits makes one, a few people make them and have made them over the years, Browning made one, but mostly you wanna be firing one of these from a semi-automatic or a pump action, because pain, a lot of pain. I fire these black clouds, uh, they, uh, they hurt, but you know, they hurt more at the other end, so that's good. There are your five, technically six common sizes, one and three quarter, two inch, two and a half, two and three quarter, three and three and a half. That's pretty cool. Let's move on. Next up, let's look at the components that make up a shotgun cartridge because, well, this is everything you need to know about 12 gauge, so we might as well cover everything you need to know. At the center of the back is the primer. This is a center fire cartridge, meaning the primer is in the center. At the table here, I actually have a pin fire. This was one of the original things that came before a center fire. What happens when you hit that primer is it squidges some explosive compound basically between two pieces of metal. The compression sets a fire. That fire goes into the powder. Before they had center fire, they had pin fire. The hammer dropped, hit this needle. The needle went into the priming compound that was in the middle and that set this thing a go. And this is a 12 ball one, which is kind of cool. This is a nickel finish, but it will be some kind of steel alloy on the inside. Works perfectly well. Obviously, brass is cooler, but it's extremely expensive and making it out of this is different. You may notice that these two cartridges, for example, have very different brass lengths. People refer to high brass shells to indicate more powerful shells, but honestly, it makes no difference now. I have an example at the table as well of a cartridge that has plenty of power, but is entirely made of plastic, which is kind of cool. There's a slight metal inset on the inside, but just to hold the primer pocket. This just goes to show that you don't actually need this part of the cartridge anymore, but it is it, firstly beautiful and secondly probably better than making it entirely from plastic because at least this rusts and rots away if you do accidentally drop one outside. High brass started becoming a thing or gained its infamy back in the day when cartridges were made of paper like this, a lot of examples. The high brass came up on higher pressure cartridges with more powder because in days of slower burning powder, being black powder and early nitro, you would get a burning of the paper on the inside. So having high brass meant that you wouldn't burn through the paper hull. 
That disappeared as an issue within a couple of decades. However, the high brass firstly looks lovely, is kind of an indicator of quality, and secondly, denotes that this is a powerful cartridge. A lot of it is just marketing and branding now, but I must admit, who doesn't prefer the look of this to the look of this, or even this? As already discussed in front of the primer and inside the brass, if you like it, the head of the case, is powder. I have three different types of powder here. As you can see, most powder used in shotgun cartridges is flake format. Stick format is generally used for rifle and pistol ammunition, but you do see it in certain shot shells, which is interesting. There is two types of powder you should worry about or know about. One is single base, one is double base. Single base uses nitrocellulose as its main energy source, its only energy source. It's extremely stable, it doesn't fluctuate in temperature greatly, but you can produce less power with it than double base, technically speaking. Although you get both powders, you can get in both fast burn rates and slow burn rates, you can make a cartridge very fast on a single base or very slow. So people who say double base powders will give you more power across the board, it's a lie. Double base powders actually use nitrocellulose and nitroglycerin. It allows you to get a more explosive burn rate, essentially, and produce more power, potentially, if needed. What it does suffer from, however, is huge variances or noticeable variances in temperature. In extreme cold, it will be slow. In extreme heat, it will be super fast. Meaning if you take that same cartridge loadout with double base and you shoot it in Norway in the winter and you shot it in Texas in the summer, you will notice the recoil is very different, the speed is different, the pressure is different. The recoil would be way stiffer in Texas because the powder would burn much faster and hotter. In Norway, it would burn much slower, technically speaking, because of the nitroglycerin content in double base. Again, the variances aren't massive. It's something I'd actually like to go and do, but I even make a point, even though I shoot single base powders a fair amount of the time. But regardless of the powder type, it's wise to keep your cartridges at a consistent temperature. Cold cartridges will not perform well as hot cartridges. That's across the board for both, but you'll notice a way bigger difference, obviously with the double base powder because it's performing differently as well. That could just be in my head, but also it's a nice ritual to take your cartridges and put, put them somewhere warm the night before and yeah, maybe. Just be aware that that's an issue. Keep your cartridges close to your body if you're hunting in the cold. The end. In front of the powder sits a wad. As you can see, there is the powder. Inside you see the primer and the bonding piece that bonds the plastic to the brass, the case head. And inside is a wad. Wads take many forms. This is a whole hydro wad, meaning it's a biodegradable form of a plastic wad. And this has a shot cup. This is a HDPE plastic wad, less biodegradable. You know, it will degrade in like 4,000 years. That's, that's nice. Inside this shot cup, as you can see, you have the shot. This is kind of handy. This keeps the shot off the barrel. Certainly with steel cartridges, you need to have some barrel protection. Otherwise, you can score the inside, rip the chrome off, various issues. With a competition cartridge, plastic wads and, you know, biodegradable plastic substitute wads will give you a better seal in the barrel, better consistency. And that shot cup holds the shot together for a little bit after it comes out the barrel. Not a great deal, but enough. You'll generally get better consistency and performance from plastic wads than you will fiber wads, although I've shot some pretty good scores on some pretty tough targets with fiber wads as well. The But the difference is there. They're generally a little softer recoiling as well because of the technology and this huge dampening piece you have here. So that obviously squishes when you go up the barrel and that just helps give you more progressive recoil, which is interesting. This is a fiber wad. This is completely biodegradable and made from completely natural sources. This is the fiber wad, and this is the obturator card, the overpowder card. In some cartridges, they will replace this with plastic to give you the quality of seal and consistency you may get on one of these. This is just a space filler, really, but you so you get, very, you get varying lengths depending on the cartridge length and the volume of shot that's in there, but you do need a certain amount of wad to actually make a cartridge that patterns and performs to a decent standard. Wad design varies massively. You get things called spreader wads that are designed to punch that shot out massively. You get wads that are hold together because the tops are sealed better. You get all kinds of different wads. They're all appropriate for the application they're appropriate for. for. Most of my training, in fact, most of my shooting is done with fiber wads because, well, I am uh, a uh, green eco dude, generally speaking, and throwing plastic around outside of a 
clay ground I just don't feel too great about. I use a lot of these hydro rods because they'll degrade in a few years time. But there are a lot of things out there. Pick the right one for the application, as similar to everything we're talking about. There are so many variances. Remember that your shotgun may have a different bore to your friend's shotgun, so when they find a cartridge, they say pattern's the best thing since sliced bread. Yours may not necessarily do that. And even I found two guns with similar, same barrel profiles, similar stuff, will find one cartridge ever so slightly different to the other. Again, there's a lot of black magic that goes on here because of the lack of control of the variables out there. If you tried to write an equation for the perfect shotgun cartridge with all the variables that are involved, both outside variables and inside variables, temperature variables, bore size variables, cartridge length variables, I don't think it's possible. I think the greatest minds on earth would struggle to come up with an equation that would actually give you anything more than just a, these are all right. Take a cartridge, use a cartridge, find one that's appropriate for your gun and application, pattern plate it, shoot it against paper, shoot it against ballistic gel, and actually double check that it's, it's good. Obviously, no substitute for real life testing, depending on what application is, clays, game, whatever across the course of the world, mammals, find out for yourself. There is no recommendation of cartridge other than this one works really well. And generally speaking, a good cartridge will be good in every gun, but it's about those marginal gains, right? Which cartridge you like, because the powder and the type of powder, the way the powder is set to be a fast burn rate, so you can make a slower cartridge kicky if you want. And that was also an interesting discussion with a cartridge manufacturer, is they purposefully made one of their cartridges kicky because the market likes a bit of recoil. They could have made it super smooth at the same speed, but they chose not to. People are different, everyone's different. Next, shot size. Before we talk about shot sizes and the sort of things they're for, it's probably worth mentioning that in the front here is your load. That in a shotgun can either be a single slug, a single lump of lead that flies out the end and you could be fairly accurate with, all the way down to something like this. This is a seven and a half shot. These are very small, run out of energy relatively quickly and more importantly, can't impart much energy to kill certain species. So picking the right bull size, seeing as this is small and they go all the way up until like marble size, as we'll see. In fact, that's some AAA. This sort of thing is important to get right. Big bulls, small bulls, slugs, just be known you can put anything in there. And if you go on YouTube, you'll be able to see people putting God knows what in a shotgun. Right at the end of a cartridge, it closes off. This is called a crimped case. This is called a rolled turnover. Rolled turnovers are beneficial because they take up less case length than crimping, meaning you can fit more shot in a cartridge, which means that let's say in a two and three quarter inch case, this gives you a few millimeters extra, which you could fit 30 or 40 small balls into, which would give you a better load or a heavier load per case length. Generally speaking, from a manufacturing term, roll turnovers are more expensive and crimps are easier to do. So you'll find most cases are crimped. This is a six crimp, eight crimps also exist. Generally, eight crimp cases are a little more expensive and less available. You actually have to sort of swage out the case a little bit with an eight crimp to be able to get it to fold together nicely. It's also slightly harder to do and makes absolutely no bloody difference unless you're gonna reload those hulls afterwards, which not many people do. Not really. Reloading 12 gauge can be quite fun for upland hunting and really niche things, but given the cost of 12 gauge ammo still being relatively inexpensive versus something like center fire rifle ammo, given the quantity you would shoot going shooting wild birds, well, that's it. It really comes into play when you're into speciality stuff like tungsten, bismuth, two inch chambers, or trying to load up something that you just can't get in your part of the world. Next up, shot material. Shot material is an interesting one. There are four major contenders, lead being the first. Lead is currently the most dominant, although certainly in European countries that is looking to be phased out in favor of non-toxic ammunition. Lead is a great thing, it really is. This is copper coated lead, gives a little bit of extra hardness. It's soft, it's malleable, it, it performs well under pressure when those balls get hit together, they don't stay rigid like harder materials, they're soft, they work together, it's a great material for shot and bullets, as you know, that's why it's been used for a few hundred years for that exact application. Nowadays it's not so simple as just raw lead, they add other things in, the key one being antimony. The antimony content in your lead shot will dictate how hard that shot is and how shiny it is. Better polished balls fly better through the air, harder shot deforms less going up the barrel and should hit a little harder down the other end without deforming and losing energy on impact, although it will still deform because it's lead underneath. 
For close shooting, really helpful to have more antimony in the shot. Game shooting, I think it's a little better, but it's perhaps less important than for sporting clay, clays on competitive edge. They do all sorts of other things, copper plating, nickel plating. There is endless varieties and mixtures of lead shot and the coatings they put on it. Look, I, I don't really care too much, but what I do know is better quality lead produces better kills. I'm gonna say better quality, I mean better antimony content, better finished, more round, more consistent, produces better kills both on clays and game. Cheaper shells with less antimony and less coatings or no coatings, as the case usually is, doesn't do quite so well, but at normal shotgun ranges, it probably doesn't make that much difference. It's only when you get to the extremes or the top of your game where those, those gains actually matter. Out to 30 yards, a cheaper shell will still kill a bird completely effectively. It's only at those longer ranges where you're pushing the limits of a shotgun that you really want to start considering what's in your shot. If you think a bit like rifle ammo, if you're just going and shooting deer in a woodland locally and you max shots 50 yards, you'll buy whatever's on the shelf, whatever's cheap. If you're going on some kind of special hunt that involves a longer shot potentially and is there's much more riding on that one bullet, you start actually caring more about making sure that is the perfect tool for the job. I know most people buy by price and I don't begrudge anyone doing that. The world is getting more expensive and money is getting a little tighter. However, if you actually backtrack, let's say premium clay shell to decent entry level clay shell, to go and shoot a round of 50 clays with the set costs of clays and diesel and bacon roll obligatory and coffee obligatory, the extra three or four pounds to get into a better cartridge seems pretty negligible. Although I've also, you know, been known to not have the extra four pounds and still want to go shooting. So who cares? Certainly when you get into competitive shooting, those that few quid extra goes quite a long way. But cue someone commenting and says, oh, I kill them all with cheap Russian imports whatever it's cool i see what the best boys do i know most of them are sponsored but i also know a lot of them that aren't a premium shell gives you better results yes it might not be worth the extra increase in money but you gotta pay it if you want it and that's the way the world works lead done this is steel it's not actually steel it's a very soft iron you know if they used a hardened steel there'd be a lot of guns being very well damaged out there this is a soft iron it's still not as soft as lead, obviously, but soft as can be. It is lighter weight, it has less mass than lead, meaning you will need to go up a couple of bull sizes to be able to get the same results down range. If you shoot the same shot size, it will decelerate faster and lose a lot of energy in the air before it hits what you're shooting at. So certainly when thinking about steel, you do need to be thinking of larger balls. Lead, smaller balls for application generally than steel, but there you go. So I'd say I wouldn't shoot much under a steel four. If you're going into long range ducks, that kind of thing, I'd probably start looking at steel ones, steel twos, geese, again, the same steel ones, steel BBs, steel SGs, just to be able to guarantee a similar result. Steel shot has come on so far in the last 20 years. It has a bad rap. I shot steel pretty much exclusively the last three seasons and I so I found some great results. I didn't suffer anything bad. I killed some birds I will be very proud of. I shot lead on the last two days I was out just because I wanted to shoot lead and just remind myself of what that was like. Plus, I had a 20 bore and no steel shot for it. It's Lead is ballistically better, but steel now is knocking on its heels. Steel cartridges are loaded differently. They need different powders. In fact, you can see this powder is different to the others. They need to be loaded sympathetically because of the pressure steel produced because of that lack of give. The wads have to be different, generally thicker. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. There are two others you need to know about, and that is bismuth and tungsten. Bismuth is the ultimate lead substitute. It acts very similarly. It's a little more brittle, but again, that's coming a long way. We're making better compounds, better coating to get bismuth and its mass that is close to lead to actually perform like lead when shot out of a gun, being hit by that massive force and shoved forward. More importantly, when it hits the target, you don't want it to break up. There's a few issues with certain batches of bismuth out there, but again, most manufacturers are now so far on top of it that is in the past. Bismuth is expensive. You're looking at roughly two and a half times to three times the cost of lead game shells. That's quite a lot of money. But if you have an old gun and can't use lead, then that's what you've got to use. A lot of old guns will be good for steel, but you know if you don't want to alter one that isn't right for it, you are got to be using bismuth. Tungsten is your other option. Tungsten is sort of the ultimate shot. It is better than lead. Tungsten is extremely dense, denser than lead, meaning you can fit the 70 grams of tungsten into a three and a half inch chamber 
rather than the 56 grams or 63 grams, whatever, as you could fit in with lead. Tungsten being that much heavier means that you can use a smaller ball size than you would with lead to get a similar result. So if you shot a tungsten 7, you're going to feel like you're shooting a lead 5 ballistic with the energy downrange. That's quite good. You start using tungsten 5s, 4s, or 3s, you've got a cartridge that's effective to 80 plus yards. That is insane. Insanely good. I really like it, but now we're talking like three pounds a shot, two pound 50 to three pound 50 a shot. That's quite a lot of money. However, as we said, if you're going somewhere with super high birds or you're going to go on a shoot where you may only shoot three, four, five, six cartridges, that's not that bad. If you're taking it driven game shooting and you're gonna burn 50 to 100 cartridges, that's not so ideal, but it's still the cheapest part of the day. If you shot 100, let's say you shot 200 tungsten cartridges, you're into 600 and let's say 700 pounds the day you've been on to shoot 200 cartridges if you're shooting relatively straight is what is a 300 bird day that will cost you three and a half grand it's all relative it is an expensive hobby to go shooting large volumes of birds if you are shooting smaller volumes why not try tungsten it's not a bad thing although generally speaking as i've said save it for wildfowl enjoy the process it is expensive but given that you might shoot a box of ammo on a wildfowling season that's not that big an investment it's just it hurts at the time you buy it. Final note on tungsten is that it is extremely hard and quite abrasive, meaning it needs to go in a plastic or plastic substitute wad to save it touching your barrels. The beauty of bismuth is it can be fired with a fiber wad and be completely guilt free when it comes to launching some of this into the uh, environment. Just a note, that's why bismuth is good. It has a few downsides, but not many. The fact you can shoot it with a fiber wad and it's not lead will appeal to many and that's good. All right, now we'll talk about shot sizes. So shot comes in various sizes, as you can see. The benefits of small shot is you get more balls per ounce. The benefits of large shot is that you get more energy retained whilst it's flying through the air. Obviously, larger balls carry more energy because they decelerate faster because of the mass, somewhat physics. Let's have a look at some of the sizes and talk very quickly about what they actually mean. This is size eight shot, perfect for clay pigeon shooting and small game. It's 2.2 millimeters and you get 450 of these balls per ounce. This is a size shot seven and a half. You get 400 balls per ounce and it's 2.3 millimeters wide. The difference between a seven and a half and eight is minimal, although people will talk about it like it actually matters. Seven and a halves can be used for close range pigeons and grouse, but more popularly for those birds would be a shot size six. This is a shot size six. Shot size six is 270 balls per ounce and 2.6 millimeters. It's quite a large jump up in size, quite a large decrease in shot and pellet count, but the energy in one of these will kill a bird more effectively than a seven and a half, generally speaking. These are fives, a little bit larger again, 2.8 millimeters, 220 balls per ounce. And these are shot size four. Shot size four, 170 balls per ounce, 3.1 millimeters. Steel shot sizes are slightly different. This is a steel shot size four, a little bit smaller, to be honest, by the look of it, but it is all of 0.1 of a millimeter. Bear in mind that these are UK shot sizes and American shot sizes will be one larger. A six is a seven, a UK seven and a half is a US eight and a half, a UK six and a half is an American seven and a half. You then get threes at 3.3 mil, twos at 3.6 mil and ones at 3.8 mil with 140, 190 balls a go. You then get BBs at four millimeters and 70 balls per load. You then get big balls like this that would be represented by treble A's and SG's. Treble A's 5.1 millimeters, SG's 8.4 millimeters. This is for foxes, deer, very, very long range geese. And in certain countries, warfare. One thing I do know about these is I wouldn't want to get shot by them and they are particularly effective against large mammals. In the UK you can't shoot deer with shotguns with any ease but in most of the rest of the world you can. This is where these come in handy. I have made a colossal mess at the table here today in uh, the course of this video and I've quite enjoyed it. Shot all over the floor, powder and componentry all over the table and we have a couple of things left to discuss. The first is cartridge speed. The first thing you need to know is that the speed of sound is 1125 feet per second. That being the case, you get supersonic cartridges and subsonic cartridges. Subsonic cartridges make up a very small portion of the market. They're used in shotguns with silencers to remain completely silent. They're used by shooting schools to reduce noise burden and, you know, 
because they're generally a lot softer. It's kind of nice for students to start with something real soft. And they're used in urban environments in uh, other places for reasons that you're not allowed to use guns for in the UK. Supersonic cartridges is what we're going to talk about because, you know, speed kills. This is where someone comments pattern kills. Pattern kills too, and that's kind of important. But we're not talking about patterning today particularly. Speed makes cartridges more powerful, technically speaking, right? If you launch the same ball faster, it will have more energy downrange. There's a whole host of people who will argue that out. There's some interesting science there as well. So if you fired a cartridge at, let's say, 1,500 feet per second, and you fired one at 200 feet per second less, so maybe you fired one at 1,600 and 1,400, at 40 yards, there would only be a 60 feet per second difference. At 60 yards, there'd only be a 40 feet per second difference. And these people argue that the speed actually doesn't matter and it's the pattern that matters. Slower cartridges generally pattern a little bit tighter as well. So they're saying a slightly denser pattern of slightly slower a shot will hit harder down the other end because of the cumulative balls hitting. I don't really agree with that from my experience so much. A little bit of speed is better than less speed the right cartridge for the right bore diameter and the right choke, once you've done that pattern plate testing and the gel testing and some real life testing, I have found that those 40 feet per second extra account for a hell of a lot. Certainly when you're out at 60 yards, I'd rather have the 40 feet per second extra. Given that at that range, that makes up sort of 10% of the extra speed. If you put it like that, would you rather a cartridge that's 10% faster at that distance or 10% slower? Well, I'd, I'd go 10% faster, but everybody is different and I look forward to your thoughts in the comments on that because everybody has their own opinions and I'd love some science. Although, as we've discussed, the quantity of science is um, pretty lacking. There's a lot of opinion and a lot of, I did this test and this happened, but if I did it with a different gun, another thing would have happened. I always take references from like great shooters and people who shoot a lot and most of them will opt for not too fast a cartridge because the recoil can become unbearable over a long day trying to shoot heavy loads super fast, but a cartridge with a bit more speed than a bit less speed. We're actually limited as to what speeds you can push ammunition at, which is the final note. If you're home loading, the sky is the limit, but there are two bodies that regulate how much pressure a shotgun cartridge can have, and that is CIP in Europe and SAMI pretty much everywhere else. SAMI specs are a little bit higher than European CIP specs, meaning that American cartridges can be pushed a little harder and faster. CIP puts limits on certainly things like steel shots that inhibit us over here from making these as good as they can be. Given that those same guns that pass CIP proof also pass SAMI proof, it's interesting they won't increase CIP to at least you know, uh, allow us to shoot more powerful cartridges. However, when it comes to home loading, you can home load yourself whatever you want to make it as powerful as you want with the risk of blowing your own head off. I implore you to not do that. This is why these limits are in place. I'm not saying well, we should bust them, but if people are loading and selling SAMI spec cartridges and they're fine, we should all be able to load to that level. And perhaps with modern metallurgy and steel, we could relook at them all and go, all right, maybe there's another proof level that is required so that we can start loading up some big boy ammo. I've shot some home loaded cartridges over the years and they have been absolutely wild, usually in sub gauges where people don't push the pressure too high at all and the offerings aren't there for the sort of super magnums. You can have some pretty potent stuff and it's perfectly safe and kills, you know, marginally better. But we'll all take marginally better when it comes to killing because we're looking for clean kills when you're hunting. And certainly when you're breaking clays, you're looking for little balls of soot as opposed to chip in half in an ideal world. So I'm being attacked by my dog, I'm not playing with myself. Final thing we'll talk about is shot string. Remember when you're shooting these things, they produce a pattern. With a slug, you only get one projectile, but with everything else, those balls disperse. They don't stay at 0.729, they disperse. You have something in the end of your barrel called a choke that changes constriction, but more importantly than constriction, you also have something called shot string. Meaning as the first, as these, let's say, two balls go out, this is the first, this is the last, there's a lot of other balls. This first one will continue faster, not always, but let's say this front one continues faster and the back one will tail off. Let's say it's got a little bit of a deformity. As that front one progresses, the back one gets further and further away as they go out into space. What that leaves you with is something called a shot string, a long tail, it's a ball with a tail, generally speaking, of shot flying through the air. Let's say at 40 yards through a, or 30 yards through a three quarter choke, you're running a three and a half to four foot wide pattern, that pattern will also likely be eight foot long. And so that's worth bearing in mind. A lot of people put a lot of stake in this, but I don't particularly. 
Uh, and the reason is this. At 40 yards, your shot is potentially still going is still going at 660 feet per second. Let's say at 40 yards, it has an 11 foot shot string. That, let's say a bird is a foot thick and your pattern's four and a half, five foot wide. It would take something like 0 0.04 seconds for all of your shot to pass that target. I don't know how important that is. I, I do know that the chance of it flying into the tail of your shot is, is present, like it's possible, but for the most part, you can think about it however you want. You just need to put the gun in the right place, aim to hit it with the front of your pattern because that's where most of the death is going to be, right? The chances of it flying into your tail are so minimal, the chances of hitting it broadside are relatively high. Hoping for tail end shots is probably stupid. We've all shot birds and clays and all sorts in the back end of the target when we're behind it and we've caught it with those outlying pellets on the pattern. The answer should always be to put that gun in the right place regardless of what shot and what load, and what brass, and what case, and what chamber length, and whatever speed you want. And that, I think, is pretty much everything there is that you need to know about 12 gauge. There is a lot more we could go into in terms of history, powder choices, really technical, boring stuff. But for now, that is a full basic rundown. Guys, take care, goodbye, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching, guys. This channel is made possible by our amazing sponsors. You can find out more about them in the description down below. And if you want to support the channel, you can join as a member. You get loads of extra content, well, some extra content, and occasionally we hook up and go clay shooting together as a membership group. If you don't feel like joining today, we really appreciate you watching and subscribing. Have a wonderful day.